talking about the nature of gases. The song by Queen Under Pressure, of course, sets the mood. Um, but let's get started on this. Here's Sheldon. Love is in the air. He says, wrong. Nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide are in the air. Okay, so we're talking about gases today. And the first thing I want you to do is pause this video in a second here and write down as many characteristics of a gas as you can. Also write down how would you define gas pressure? What causes gas pressure? Just write down anything that you know or any of your ideas. Okay, once you've done that, let's talk about something called kinetic molecular theory. It sounds kind of scary, sounds big and fancy, but if you really break it down, kinetic just means movement. So we're talking about the movement of molecules, and more specifically, we're talking about gases. Okay, so there's some important features of KMT. Gases are made of particles that are in constant random motion. There's a little animation showing that there. And this is responsible for fun smells like a skunk that sprayed the road. Um, this is called diffusion. Also responsible if someone sprays perfume or Axe cologne anywhere basically in the nearby vicinity that it will actually reach your nose within sometimes a matter of seconds. Okay, and that's because gas particles are moving all the time and carrying those smell molecules to you. So, what about this then? Okay, oxygen molecules travel on average 1,700 kilometers per hour. This means that if you had a hot cheese pizza in Bellevue, those smell molecules could actually make it to New York City in about two hours. Why doesn't that happen? Well, as gas molecules move, they move in straight lines, but they change direction as soon as they hit something. That can be another gas molecule, that can be um, pretty much anything. So those pizza good smelling molecules on their way to New York City, um, one of them might make it, but most of the time they're going to hit another gas molecule or hit a tree or something and change their direction. Okay, so what about the relationship between temperature and speed? The speeds of particles in a sample are not all exactly the same. Okay, so we usually refer to their average speed. As the temperature goes up, these gas particles start moving faster and faster. So temperature is really just a measurement of the speed. Okay, so if you're feeling like the room is really hot, that what that means is the molecules in that room are colliding with your skin more frequently because they're moving faster and they're actually transferring that energy to your skin and so you heat up and you feel hot. Um, vice versa, in a really cold room, the molecules are moving really slowly. You're probably giving up your energy, um, you're heating up the room. Okay, so what about the units for how we measure temperature? Fahrenheit, you know about, I'm certain. Celsius is a favorite in science. But when you're talking about gases, Kelvin is used, and there's a good reason for that. Celsius and Fahrenheit were kind of made up for convenient reasons, um, versus Kelvin was made, was made for uh, zero means zero. So at absolute zero, there's no movement whatsoever of molecules. All motion stops. So that really comes in handy um, versus degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit when zero means cold, but molecules are still moving relatively quickly. Um, there's an easy way to convert degrees Celsius into Kelvin. You add 273. Okay, so zero degrees Celsius is really 273 Kelvin. Okay, so imagine how cold zero Kelvin would be. Negative 273. All right, let's talk a little bit about gas pressure. So you saw the animation with the moving gas particles bouncing off the walls and bouncing off each other. The more that they bounce and collide, the more pressure. But what does that mean? Well, it's really a force that's exerted by gas molecules per, per square unit um, of surface area. Okay, so if you're thinking about this and you're in a hot room, again, those, there's a lot more molecules that are bouncing per square inch of your skin than if you're in a really cold room. Units for measuring pressure. You've probably seen pounds per square inch. You may have seen atmospheres, kilopascals, and then there's also millimeters mercury. This is 
These are all different types of just measuring pressure. Okay, so PSI, you've probably seen this on a car tire or a bike. If you've uh, ever had to fill a car tire or a bike tire on your own, you will want to pay attention to that reading because if you go over it, um, your tire can blow up. As we talk about gases, it's important to understand that gases have volume, they take up space, they also take the shape of their container, and they can be compressed. So imagine a balloon and uh, taking that and pushing the balloon in so that those gas particles are compressed, they get closer together. When you're measuring volume, you measure in liters or sometimes milliliters, which is really just a conversion factor of a thousand. Um, there are 1,000 milliliters in one liter. In class, we had a Gatorade race. We had two people come up front. Each of them had a clear plastic cup with a straw. Seemed like they were identical, same amount of Gatorade, but one of the straws had a lot of holes poked in it. And so that person um, was having a hard time and they lost the race, but it was unfair. So the next thing I want you to do is take a second and write down or just think about uh, how do straws work anyways? Don't just say they suck, okay? Because there's more to it and it involves gas pressure. Um, in words, the first thing that happens when you're drinking through a straw is you use your mouth to reduce the pressure that's above the liquid but still inside the straw. Now, the pressure on the outside of the uh, liquid or on the outside of the straw, that liquid is greater relative to the pressure that's above the liquid inside the straw. So liquid is basically forced up from high pressure to low pressure. So let's draw a little picture of this. Here's my glass. Here's my straw. Okay, and of course there's liquid that's in the straw part too. There's gas molecules inside the straw. There's gas molecules outside of the straw. And so when you start inhaling to try and get your pop or whatever it is that you're drinking, you're reducing the number of gas particles that are inside the straw above the liquid. So this is a low pressure system. Now, these particles are basically winning. So they have more force, they're pushing down on this liquid and it gets pushed then up to your lips. Now, the person who was struggling, who had a bunch of holes in their straw, okay, all over, as they were trying to decrease this pressure inside, more particles from outside were just rushing back in. So um, there wasn't this difference in pressure like there is here. Forgot to write high pressure here. Okay. All right, it's fun to try and that's an easy one to do at home. On the weather channel, if you're watching it, they're not gonna refer to uh, gas pressure as that. They're gonna call it atmospheric pressure and you may have heard of a barometer before. Um, barometers measure atmospheric pressure, and the only two times that atmospheric pressure changes is when weather changes, and then it depends on your altitude. So if you're above sea level, if you're climbing a mountain, or if you're underwater. So let's talk about how barometers worked in the early days. Um, Specifically, we're going to talk about the, where the units millimeters mercury came from. Okay, so if you've never seen mercury, that's a good thing because it's really toxic. Uh, it's a liquid at room temperature and it's a silvery metal. So imagine you have a dish of that. Okay, so here it is in this dish. Okay, imagine though also that there's a tube that's connected to this dish. And I'm not good at drawing in 3D, but depending on how many gas particles there are pressing down on the mercury, that determines how high the mercury level is raised inside. Okay, so let's say this is at sea level. The height of this tube would be 760 millimeters high, so they call it 760 millimeters mercury. Okay, now if there were more pressure outside, this would cause the liquid to go even higher. Okay, so maybe you're below sea level and it's 800 millimeters mercury. In your notes, you're supposed to draw a picture of a mercury barometer that's placed at the top of Mount Rainier. Okay, so here's Mount Rainier. There are way less gas particles at the top of Mount Rainier. So when you draw your barometer, 
my quick sketch, the level of mercury isn't going to go up very high because there's not a lot of force pushing down on that liquid to push it up into the glass tube. Okay, so I think it's around 150 millimeters mercury at the top of Mount Rainier. Okay, so very different. All right. Are there more ways to measure atmospheric pressure? Yes, we already mentioned the units, but here are the numbers at sea level. Um, you'll see kilopascals would be 101.3, atmospheres would be 1 atm. Also, you may see sometimes uh, TOR, T-O-R-R, that would be also be 760. So how much pressure are you under? This is just a little interesting statistic. Um, even though you've got a lot of pressure on you from school and all your other stuff going on in your life, Earth's atmospheric pressure is constantly pushing on you with a force of 14.7 pounds per square inch. So imagine a square inch of your skin and a 15 pound dumbbell on it. You're so used to it, it's not like you feel it, um, but that's how much pressure you're under. Of course, it doesn't squash you because you've got bones and tissue and skin um, pushing back, holding you together. So what about the weather? Um, you may hear people talk about this, my grandparents like to talk about this, when the atmospheric pressure is dropping, that's a good indicator that storms, rain, and winds are coming into town. Versus if pressure's going up, that's a sign of good dry weather. Of course, it's more complicated that, than that. Um, ask a meteorologist for more, but those are some basics. Finally, why do your ears pop when you're on an airplane and why do they hurt when you're deep underwater? Well, it has to do with the difference of pressure between your inner ear and your outer ear. Okay, so there's something called a eustachian tube that's kind of in between them. And when you go on an airplane, when you go up, you're taking off, all of a sudden now, the pressure outside, even though they try to pressurize the cabin, the pressure outside your ear is less. The pressure inside your ear is greater. So some of those gas particles want to be released um, and push out so then it's equalized okay and there's a gross story um, that I read online that there's a lar large amount of people who have ear infections that accidentally get all their ear pus on the passenger next to them um, because when that popping happens it's like a little burst of whatever's inside um, so that's kind of gross finally I want to point you in the direction of this uh, cool simulation you can play around with the behavior of gases a little bit more and test yourself out on that. Um, so that is about it for gases. Good luck.